Okay, so good morning. Um, what I want to talk briefly about this morning is uh, some work that I started thinking about uh, towards the end of last year, which is how we can try to connect some of the microscopic properties that we will see with Rosetta to the more macroscopic properties that go into our global comet models and that then, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully match to the, uh, to the activity we see. So clearly our models have got more complex, uh, 1D, 2D, 3D, and so on. We model more lateral heat flow and topography, shadowing and so on, but, but still the question remains to me, how sensitive are these models to some of the inputs that go in? I mean, many of the inputs clearly are not so well constrained by the, the data that we have to date, and of course many of these inputs that we can measure on a global scale actually have a microscopic origin, and so probably they vary considerably over and under the surface. So with Rosetta, of course, we have this unprecedented uh, time to study the evolution, but also an unprecedented range of length scales. We have data from really nanometers to micrometers up to, of course, the global observations of the nucleus and the coma. And somehow we need to integrate these into a coherent picture that, that makes sense as much as possible. So um, what am I talking about when I say microscopic and macroscopic parameters? Well, really, on the right, the sort of macroscopic parameters that I'm talking about are more the things that go into perhaps global models. So the, the strengths, the, the thermal conductivity, bulk porosity, and so on. And pretty much all of these parameters are in some way influenced by the actual grain scale parameters. So the real microscopic parameters that you have for individual grains. So their shape, how do we describe their shape, uh, the surface to volume ratio, uh, coefficient of restitution, surface energy, and all of these parameters really uh, feed into almost every one of these parameters. So if we uh, can measure these, and some of these parameters we will have data from, from Rosetta, can we therefore say something about how they connect to the larger scale properties? Okay, so clearly the size and shape of particles are important. Uh, we try and model them with spheres because spheres are easy. But at the end of the day, the evidence we have from light scattering, from IDPs and so on, tells us that probably we're dealing with complex shapes and really we have to think about how this influences the larger scale parameters. So the size is clear, this has an effect. We know that different forces scale differently with size. And uh, so if you take the Scherer's et al. paper looking at uh, forces on asteroid surfaces, it becomes clear that uh, for even chunky sized particles, cohesion between two particles, so van der Waals, simple van der Waals adhesion, is an important force, and you have to include this when you do your models. And so this means, for example, that you cannot, when you're, uh, you cannot use this idea of a critical grain size between the balance of the drag force and the weight and centrifugal acceleration, unless you really <coughs> consider the cohesive forces, which dominate the weight of the particle by orders of magnitude, potentially, for even centimeter-sized particles. And there's lots of other fine-scale parameters that go into this, for example, the, the, the roughness. So the shape is, is kind of hard to categorize and put into a model in detail, but we know that the shape is going to affect how the particles pack together, how we get bulk porosity. Uh, we know, of course, that you get uh, complex shape particles result in interlocking and therefore shear strength. We see this from soils on the Earth. And we know that the cohesion is also dependent on the shape. So uh, spheres uh, with particles stuck on the surface or with, with fine asperities, so with, with sharp little bits that have a small radius of curvature, these have a much reduced cohesive force compared to a, a bulk particle, which has the sort of counterintuitive effect that, that on Earth we're used to seeing large particles that, that flow and roll much more easily than rough particles, but at the microscopic cohesive level, rough particles generally flow more easily than smooth ones because they have smaller radii of curvature at their interface points. And of course, heat transfer um, is also something we're critically interested in and at least, um, as Bastian will tell us later, for some regimes, this is mostly through particle-particle contacts until, of course, you get to higher, higher temperatures. And this is determined, again, by the number of contacts per volume and the cohesive force that pulls particles together and produces a given area for, and don't for heat conduction. And organic layers that you may have. Sure, sure. Yeah, if you indeed. atomic layers will change the whole picture. Yeah. I mean, the surface energy of particles, of course, can vary a lot depending on, on, on the surface there. So. What I'm starting with mainly here is starting with a nice dry regolith so that I can get some idea of how one could model the transition between microscopic and macroscopic properties. Uh, particle roughness is also important, and this goes back to the cohesion case. Uh, 
Uh, we see, for example, that uh, you can start trying to include these in the models in different ways, looking at the radius of these asperities and how this affects the, uh, the contact points and the contact area between the particles. And, and hopefully, as I'll mention a little bit later, we will have some MIDAS data to uh, support this. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do was see if it's possible to use the, the sort of standard technique of discrete element modeling to describe some of these. And at the moment, I haven't got much to show you that relates so much to the comet, but I can hopefully explain to you uh, what I hope to do and give you some examples of how the technique works. And then uh, hopefully when we speak again, I'll have some more cometry related parameters. So the, the code I'm using is called lights, which uh, have many Gs in it, but it's effectively uh, based on a molecular dynamics code that is very well known and understood. And it extends this code for granular particles. So more macroscopic particles that, uh, that are allowed to rotate as well as move. And it accounts for, for example, cohesive forces, and you can even include electrostatics and so on, if you, if you want to look at particle charging, for example. So under the hood, yeah, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's a soft sphere model. That means that particles are allowed to overlap somewhat, and you then account for the repulsive forces, cohesive forces, and heat transfer through the grains according to the degree of overlap and therefore the area that you have for, for conduction. Okay, so just a few examples to give you an idea of how this can look when you actually run the model. Uh, for example, here you see the most simple test you can do with this kind of code is uh, an angle of repose test. So basically we know that one of the observations we can get from uh, a granular surface is looking at the maximum slope angle that we see. And this is unfortunately not a unique parameter, but it is connected to the intrinsic property of the grains, to the friction angles, to the shapes of the particles, and so if you can constrain some of these individual particle properties, you can get some idea on what uh, slope angles are sustainable in a surface under low gravity. Now, all of these very simple examples I'm showing you are, are cheating examples. That means they have very low Young's modulus. That means they have high degree of cohesion when I'm trying to show cohesion. And it allows me to run these simulations very quickly to get an idea of what's going on. Uh, for the cometary case, it becomes a little more complicated. Low gravity means that you have to be very careful with your time steps and how long you can run the model for. And of course, you have to run uh, for a significantly uh, longer amount of time. OK, so fine. Another thing you can do is look at segregation, so size sorting. So perhaps this is not so uh, intrinsically important for the comet case. But for asteroids, of course, for Itokawa, say, one of the reasons suggested for this distribution of, uh, of smooth planes is that there could be some global shaking, that impacts can cause vibrations that travel through the surface. And this, this is just the, the Brazil nut effect that, that everyone knows about. So this is simply showing that depending on the density and other properties of your particles, you can have segregation of different sizes of particles in a granular system. And this doesn't happen necessarily just through vibration. You can imagine it happening through fluidization. So when gas flows through a granular medium, you can have some kind of fluidized effect where you can also have sorting of particles. Fine, okay, you can build aggregates, of course. This is, this is not really uh, so exciting here, but you can, you can use these aggregates later in simulations. So, for example, you can stick the aggregates together by cohesion, and this is, again, not so interesting for comets, but you can, uh, you can let them fly, you can see what happens, and so on. Uh, more interesting for the cometary case is to stick together particles to make rigid aggregates that have a defined shape, and then all of the things that I've showed you, the angle of repose, thermal conductivity experiments, you can do with complex shapes, with aggregate shapes, where you can really try to get a handle on what porosity the, uh, a packing of these kind of aggregate shapes makes and how heat flows through it. So cohesion is a critical factor, of course. Uh, you need to add this in your models. And, and this is just a simple example to show that this works, that you can indeed include cohesion. Uh, and if you do this, uh, you see that particles clump together very well. This is a super cohesion compared to, okay, compared to what you might expect. And the reason I did this particular type of geometry is that there are experiments done on parabolic flights exactly with these rotating drums under different gravity conditions. And so you can try and validate the model in some way to, uh, to see what happens. Let's try that again. No. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so it's obviously the, the cohesion in this case is far higher than you would expect in reality, and also the particle uh, wall cohesion is very high. So it's, it's not a representative case, as none of these are. OK, this was another one to play with uh, mesh imports. So one of the nice things you can do with this tool is you can import quite complex CAD meshes. So here I imported the, the, uh, the Rosetta Lander, the Philae Anchor mesh, 
And then you can, of course, uh, say, pull this out of a granular material with a given set of uh, porosity, with a given set of uh, cohesion, and you can derive the force that, uh, that is required, or the force on the mesh. Oops. And so in this case, what you see is fine. Yeah, you can see the force, the average force on the particles is shown. Don't forget, we don't want to pull it out. I understand. <laughs> and that was partly what I was thinking, is what, what forces are exerted there, depending on cohesion. But so you can derive the force on the mesh, and of course this needs to be repeated for the scale of the force? Uh, the force scale here, yeah, I've, I've removed the units intentionally, because as I say, the Young's modulus on these particles is so far from reality to allow me to do a fast simulation that it meant no, made no sense to include the real forces. So when I repeat this next, it will be with uh, a much longer runtime, but with more coherent Young's modulus. It's like 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 was the individual monomer Young's modulus here. So rather small. And the nice thing about discrete element, of course, is that you have access to everything that's going on inside the system. So you have access on a per particle level to all of the forces, and you have access to the forces between particles. So, so this means that, for example, in granular systems, we know that uh, nothing is nice and homogeneous, but in fact we have this very heterogeneous force network where force is transferred through a system via the larger particles preferentially, and even if you disturb the system, you still have this fairly constant force network. And of course, the interesting thing here is that through this force network, this is where particles are really being pushed together harder. This means you have an enhanced surface area there, and it means that you have an enhanced thermal conductivity. Now, probably on the scale we care about, these tiny effects are irrelevant. But it's interesting that you can do experiments that also show this, that thermal conductivity and, and heat flow are enhanced through these stress networks. Okay. So, moving a little bit more towards reality, we're starting to try and do some thermal conductivity experiments, uh, basically in a granular model, to compare in particular with experiments that, that, that Norbert uh, and colleagues have been doing uh, to measure the uh, thermal conductivity of uh, materials in preparation for the MUPAS experiment. And you can also do this in a granular sense, and the nice thing here is that you know very well the packing structure of your material, you can create uh, a packing of aggregates, for example, under different conditions, and then this is a, an equilibrium measurement, so I basically heat the center here and, and then wait until I reach equilibrium. And then in a similar way as you would do with a co, uh, co-centric uh, cylinder real lab experiment, you have to look at the heat flux and the geometry of the system to derive an effective thermal conductivity. And so you see how the effective thermal conductivity is some fraction of the bulk conductivity of the material. And this, of course, is, is a function of the shape and the size of the particles. And, and so on. So that's something that I need to, uh, to repeat. This was just a very simple test, again, with non-physical parameters, but it shows that you do indeed get some, uh, some effective thermal conductivity here that is about uh, two-fifths of the, of the bulk conductivity. And this was for a, a relatively narrow size distribution of particles and a void fraction of 40%. Okay, so the problem here is, of course, that Ensuring that this is in some case real is quite difficult. Some of the particle properties are known, I mean typically known from the kind of experiments that, that Jürgen showed for uh, aggregation. You know some of these properties, coefficients of restitution and, and surface energies you can measure. Um, but of course to really understand the behavior you need to compare the simulations with experiments and, and show that the bulk behavior of the materials behaves as you expect. Of course, low gravity and multi-sphere simulations do unfortunately lead to long simulation times and you have to find tricks to deal with this. On the plus side, it's very easy to add new physics because the difficulty, the computational difficulty, is in finding where the nearest neighbors are when you have millions or billions of particles in your system. But that is taken care of by the code in a rather efficient way. So if you want to add some new physics, a new force acting between particles or modifier force, as long as these are nearest neighbors or, or relatively close particles to each other, not long-range forces, it's relatively easy to do. And of course, yeah, these days with computers, clusters, GPUs, you can do this with, with some billions of particles if you want to. Okay, so some applications that I'd like to look at. Uh, the most simple thing you can imagine is give some particles what may be some kind of realistic shape, some, some complex aggregate, for example, give them proper surface energies, Young's moduli, and then see how these shapes pack, for example, under low gravity. What kind of porosity structures do they form? Uh, and once you have this structure, it's then very easy to use this for, for example, heat flow experiments in uh, using the same fixed structure 
Uh, percolation of fine particles, there's a few models in the literature where people have uh, looked at how fine particles can percolate through an existing structure, through the voids as it were. Um, if we think that the mantle is built by larger particles beginning to collect at the surface, then is it still possible that you can get small particles percolating through? So the idea here is you build a structure using your DEM model, and then you use a sort of Monte Carlo method to study percolation of particles through this structure. Um, yeah, and of course, there's a, there's a bunch of other things you can imagine doing once you've got the model working. Okay, so um, I couldn't show you many comet results, I apologize for that, but the idea, I hope, makes some kind of sense that we need to connect these microscopic properties that are important to the larger scale properties that we will have access to with certain instruments on Rosetta, and we need to connect these to the more macroscopic properties that go into our models in order to get a complete understanding of, uh, of how comets work. Um, if you have questions, I'd be happy to take them. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of tools that went into this uh, that are all open source and available if you have interest to try it yourselves. Thank you.